I always have my alarms on. I always have my alarms on. But just that I just skip them. Sometimes if I have an appointment in the morning, I can snooze my alarm for like five times. Waking up and sit on the bed and then, oh shit, I'm undocumented. Shit, 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 life is crazy. Can I say shit? You can say shit. <laughs> but then it will be edited out. No. Okay, shit, <laughs> shit, shit. Yeah, and then that's the time, mostly that's the time that your whole life situation come across. And then you become, <sighs> I just want to sleep. Yeah, but you end up getting up, taking a shower. How do you get yourself out of it? How do you make yourself take the shower? Okay, so I like watching the news, and then it wakes me up. Dozens of Guinea's representative parties... Now sometimes I scroll on Facebook to see videos of what is happening in Guinea. It usually helps, but sometimes I just don't want to do it. Eventually, I get up and go about my routine. But still, throughout the day, it's hard to stay motivated. So I find ways to always remind myself. Sometimes it becomes really difficult. I have an alarm at 12 that says, be strong. And I have an alarm at 5.30 that says, less is always enough. I think that's the kind of way that I'm, you know, making myself feel better about things. Be strong, it was a really tough time back when I was going to reapply for my asylum, so I was stressed, so, you know. Be strong. When I came the first day, it was raining so much from night to morning. I had this backpack with me with all my properties and I didn't know where to go. So my idea was to look for police. I walked around for hours. I had no idea where anything was in Amsterdam and I kept ending up on damn square until finally, somewhere around the red light district, I remember. And I saw a police car stop. I'm like, yes! I came to the lady and I said, hi, I'm an asylum seeker and I, 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 I need help. And I was like, take me in your car. Take me to the police station. It was getting late. And she said, no, sorry, we cannot do that. Uh, you need to go to the police station. The address is this. She just give me an address, you know? I didn't even know how this worked at that time. In Guinea, we don't have street names or house numbers. You just go to the nearest square and the person you're meeting just comes to pick you up. Eventually, I made it to the police station inside the Amsterdam Central Station. And I got one of the most humiliating first experience in the Netherlands. Because this policeman that I met decided to search me in front of people sitting in the hallway. He could have taken me into a room, but instead he really questioned me and searched me right there. And I felt really humiliated. Taking my pants out public, where did you get this? Where did you get this? Where did you get this? I almost said, sir, I came to you. I'm not a criminal, but I didn't want to attract negativity. I don't want to be humiliated like that, or anyone else for that matter. That's why I spent a lot of time trying to raise awareness of what life is like for undocumented people and making that life better. One of the biggest problems I see is it's crazy difficult for asylum seekers to get information, and a ton of it is in Dutch. And a lot of time, the people behind the decks have no idea how their own system works. Can you give me an example? Like the doctor. By right, everybody in the Netherlands legally should have right to health care. But then you go to the doctor, tell them, hey, I don't have health insurance. And they say, no, sorry, we can't help you. The weeks are punctuated by Thursday. Thursday is stamp day. And I have to go to the asylum center to get my fingerprint stamped. This time, Kat is coming with me. The asylum center is a big grey building complex. A former prison blends in with the grey sky. It's really cold today. 
it's so cold that for the first time in the Netherlands, I'm feeling the cold on my teeth. <laughs> As we were leaving the asylum center, I bumped into a friend. Congratulations, he just got his document. How are you, man? You good? Yeah. Congratulations, man. Thank you, bro. And you? Ah. That's what? Yeah. yeah man. Now you've been to the Netherlands, man. Netherlands, yeah. He's been undocumented for ages. He recently fell in love, got married, and now he has his residency. I mean, love is blind and can't work in a mysterious way. <laughs> Are you in love? Uh, well, 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 am I in love? I wouldn't let Kat record this bit. I'm dating someone and I'm not sure how I feel. I'm trying to be cautious, got my heart broken a few times. She wants an open relationship. What does that mean, an open relationship? I have no idea. I ask Kat if she knows what it means and she laughs. Apparently, all her friends are still wondering the same thing. We are on our way back to Amsterdam, watching the endless flat fields from the train filled with wet jackets and steamed up face masks. I always think uh, undocumented people spend a lot of time trying to find document that by the time they find document they don't know who they are as a person. I'm speaking quietly so I don't bother other people on the train. But also, this is the first time I'm sharing some of my sadness. Do you understand what I'm saying? Did it become your identity? Kat was wearing a face mask. That's why she sounds so muffled. I, I left Guinea because I had to. But what if I could stop myself from putting myself in a position of having to leave? Go to my young self and tell. Don't engage in politics. Stay out of it. Go to school. Follow the current president. Don't think about change. Stick to your script. Do you remember what you thought about before you thought about that tomorrow? When I was in Guinea, I was, I, I don't know, I didn't have any big dreams, maybe just chilling, looking up to the next end of Ramadan feast, going out to nightclub with friends. I was mostly thinking about how to finish university. The point is, education also put me in this. If I was not educated, I would have definitely have less interest in uh, trying to be active in political parties. Yeah. But I don't know. Some people, I just want more. I, I think and maybe I'm kind of I'm part of those. I'm just on this podcast for one day. But back in Guinea, I used to co-host a radio show myself, a program for learning English called English is Fun. You are listening to Nostalgia Radio 98.2 FM. English is fun, a program that is broadcast. On your radio program, you, yeah. you were encouraging people not to go to Europe. Yeah, I never had the intention of coming to Europe. I hated the fact that a lot of young people are leaving Guinea. And I thought if all the young generations of people that are strong and energetic leave, I felt that this is bad. And then that shifted at some point. Yeah, okay, the the reality hit me exactly when I was in the boat. I'm like, oh my God, I was there telling people not to go and here I am today, going against the fundamental principle of being the king that you want to see. Alarms. <laughs> Which one is this alarm? So this is my 12 o'clock alarm, be strong. Every 12 o'clock, I tell myself to be strong. Yeah. So you were on the boat and what was going through your head? We had water entering in the boat, women crying, even older people crying. And in that moment of silence, start to think. Probably going to die. Yeah. But I survived. And my advice would be to people still don't leave. The crossing from Morocco to Spain was terrifying. I tried to cross three times. The first time also the sea was very rough. We went 
for the whole day there was a lot of water in the engine and it just stopped so we started drifting luckily we were still close to the shore close enough to call for rescue but by the time the rescue came it was already becoming very dangerous but they came they came you have so many moments where you almost died mm -hmm. that are terrifying yeah what kept you trying to be honest enough i think it's just become suicidal at the end i really because if someone is to put me in this experience, I'll never do that anymore. I mean, the stress, the trauma and everything might have made me just give up. And you know what? I don't care. Because I couldn't go back to Guinea. I had no future in Morocco. And there was a slight chance that I would have a better life in Europe. So, and was willing to risk everything just to have that little bit of taste of that, to keep that hope going. Yeah. There we were. We'd finally made it to Europe, to Spain. We were given food, clothes, locked up in a prison for three days. But we were not harmed. But then, like, went for three days, could not sleep. And until I came to the Netherlands, I could not sleep for a very long time. Constant worrying, constant decision making. Am I going to get deported? When will I be safe here? So I started thinking of where to go. The next thing that I know, I'm going to the Netherlands. Like any home, I have a lot of feelings about Amsterdam. Some good, some bad. I've had a terrible time with basically all of the formal asylum seeking processes. It breaks my heart that they know that we need help than being like a robot, like a machine that is just, I can do this, I cannot do this. The hoops we have to jump through. The bureaucracy that makes even going to the cinema difficult. Not only feeling unwanted, but knowing you're literally not wanted. And to top it all off, the asylum system has been designed to make me want to go back. To give up, even though I've been through hell to get here. So many of us have died trying. And well, we can't go back. And if I don't get accepted, then all that risk was for nothing. It's so undignified. But I really love it here. I think I'm um, becoming a bit of a Dutch person. What well, makes you a Dutch person? Tell me. And now to say, do we? I like the fact that I get to say whatever I want to say, as long as I'm not being discriminatory. I can insult the government, tell them how racist they are but I've been put in prison for it. These kind of little freedoms for me means a lot that I get to speak out. I've built a life here. I've made a ton of friends through my activism. Soon I've got my interview coming up to formally apply for asylum in the Netherlands. They haven't given me a date and I've been waiting seven months already. Another hope. I've actually been running through both outcomes in my head. If I get accepted or if I get rejected. After years of not being allowed to study, to work, to rent a home, will it really be easy to actually live out all of my dreams? I have no idea what to expect, whether I'll be able to keep and build on my life here. They will decide whether or not it is worth, worth it. Being undocumented sucks, but it has made me realize a lot of stuff. It's a learning experience. So my advice would be to each and everyone to be undocumented for at least a year. And they could give me their documents and I'll use it to live their lifestyle for a year. And then we can come and discuss and share ideas. <laughs> <laughs>